What a busy week we had this week, and and uh, always something going on, I tell you. So uh, <clears throat> we uh, every year we you know we live on a farm, and so one of our traditions is to go out and get a Christmas tree. And uh, so we all get out, all seven of us, or sometimes even more than that, and we go and go search through the property to find the, the perfect Christmas tree. And oftentimes it's not the perfect Christmas tree, but that's what's fun about it. And so this year we had uh, some difficulties in scheduling everything and trying to get people uh, lined up and, and uh, people working late. And, and it gets dark so early that it's hard to find you know, a Christmas tree to go out and find one. So we decided that I, I told my boys, go out and find a Christmas tree. And then when it gets dark, we'll all go and, you know, we'll, we'll cut this tree down. So we found one. It was right up against the, the, where Daniel and Brittany live, right up against the, the garage, the back side of the garage. And it looked great. I mean, just perfect on the outside. Like, yeah, this is the right Christmas tree. So we get there, and it's, it's probably 5.30, 6 o'clock at night. We go there, get the flashlights. I get my, my electric chainsaw. We get out there. And, and so I start to get down there and look at it. And a Christmas tree is, for whatever reason, there's two stems coming right at the base, coming out like this. I'm like, oh, that's going to be hard to get. So, and then there was one branch coming straight out. And I'm like, that's going to have to come out because... We're not going to be able to get it in this tree stand. So I cut it. And when I cut it, it opened up the tree, and it looked like, it looked like this, like there was nothing in the middle. I'm like, oh, that's OK. You know, we'll just turn it around. So we cut it down. And like I said before, it was up against the building. The back side of this Christmas tree was all brown, and it was completely flat. We literally have a half of a Christmas tree. and. Uh, it's hysterical. It's so sick and funny. But it works great because you just shove it up against a wall and you only see the front half anyway, so it actually saves room. But uh, that, it was funny. So I, I guess the moral of the story is you don't send a boy to do a man's work. <laughs> and none of them are here to even get that joke. They're all sick or not here. So anyway, it was pretty funny. I'm going to do a video of it and probably send some pictures and whatever. Anyway, let's open with a word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be in church and and Lord, I'm excited about this morning's lesson and Lord, there's so much going on in, in Moses and Aaron's life, the children of Israel down there in Egypt and Lord, just open our eyes to, to what you have for us this morning and, and uh, thank you for this time of year, for Christmas and Lord, just a week from today, Lord, we celebrate your birth and what a glorious time that is. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me have a, I have a couple questions here. Which two of Joseph's brothers sought to save his life from the other brothers? Which two brothers? It's a good question. Reuben was one. Second one, not Simeon. Next one down, third brother. Judah. Simeon and Judah. Who, what high priest presided over the Sanhedrin which condemned Jesus? What was the name of the high priest, Dad? Caiaphas, Caiaphas that's correct. And... Here's a, here's a good one. Who was Nico? Nico. N-E-C-H-O. Nico. He's a king. King of Egypt? Yep. He's the man that slew King Josiah at Megiddo. So our, actually, Megiddo is the name that we, that we know of Armageddon. Um, so that was the name of the Egyptian king. All right, let's turn our Bibles to, to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Exodus. My wife changed my Bible, trying to be sneaky. I saw her do it, and then I didn't change her back. So Exodus chapter 8. 
Exodus chapter 8. Last week we talked about uh, the Nile River turning into blood. We talked about that God, the God of happy, and uh, H-A-P-I, and the significance of, of the flooding, annual flooding every year. And This year we're going to talk about a different God of Egypt. So let's start in Exodus chapter 8, verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if I refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all the borders with frogs. And the rivers uh, shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and, come, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and, and, and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let thy people go that, they may go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. All right, as we go into this, some of these verses are going to be similar throughout the rest of the book of Exodus, like this phrase here, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Moses actually says this, to Pharaoh on seven, seven different occasions. This phrase, thus say, uh, let my people go, um, is, I, I haven't counted, but it's dozens of times throughout Exodus. Either God says it to Moses, or Moses says it to the people, or Moses says it to Pharaoh, but he says it on seven distinct times to Pharaoh. But never is it just, let my people go. It's more than let my people go. There's always something else that, that is um, part of that. Let my people go. On one occasion, he says, let my people go that, that they may hold the feast in the wilderness. On another occasion, it's that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Another time, the Bible says that they may worship me. So there's always a task for the people to go, to do. And this here, right in verse number one, we see that let my people go that they may come and serve me. You know, God wants us to be free. But not just free of anything or everything. He wants us to be free in Christ. And we've all heard that statement that, that freedom isn't free. It costs somebody something. In the case of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, we know that it cost him his life. It cost him <clears throat> um, coming from the grandeur of heaven. And living on this earth and being uh, a participant in the struggles of, of here on earth, of being cold, of hunger, and, and all those different things. And, and uh, you know what? There's a huge difference between being a slave to sin and a servant of the Savior. Let me say that again. There's a huge difference between being a slave to sin and a servant of the Savior. In a, in a sense, they're... They're, they're, they're kind of common because we should want to serve our Savior. That's, that's our duty. That's, that's what he calls us to do. He doesn't force us necessarily to do that. But once he frees us from, from the bounds of sin, from, the, from that, so the stranglehold, he wants us to come and serve him. The former gives me only a single choice, which is sin. The latter provides a second chance with salvation. And I'm so thankful for that salvation. Verse number two, if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. Once again, we see that this plague is, is widespread. When he changed, when he changed the, water, uh, the Nile River, all the water in Egypt to blood, that was widespread as well. This is going to have far-reaching effects. All the borders of Egypt are, are going to be affected. The rivers and canals, the streams and the ponds will bring forth these frogs like they've never seen before. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail about the frog. The frog was considered a, a magical creature. 
the Nile River once again is going to be the source. It's going to be the source of this plague. And, and, once, and we have to understand the mindset of, of the Egyptians and, and the Nile River was that source. It was the, where everything, they, they got their, their life essentially from that Nile River when it would flood every year. The source. Let me ask you this. What is, what is your source? What's your source? Where do you go for, for your source of strength? For your hope? For your peace? For your well-being? For, for your joy? What, what is that source? And obviously Jesus should be our source. And, but Pharaoh and the Egyptians, they look to the Nile River as, as the source. And God's saying, all right, I understand. I'm going to bring what you, what you deserve from the source. Frogs are coming from that source, and essentially that source is going to be empty. It's going to bring, it's, it's, there's nothing there. Emptiness. Verse number three. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, into the house of thy servants, upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. Look at, look at this verse. It's, there's so much going on. And if we're not careful, we can just read this verse and go on to the next verse. But, but this verse is crucial to understanding the culture and the customs of Egypt and, and, uh, and the de devastation that this, that's going to happen very shortly. So what, what's this verse really mean? Let, let's go into the frog. What did the Egyptians believe about the frog? Frogs were considered sacred animals. They were, essentially, they were worshipped. And they were regarded as, as symbols of, of procreation. Just like the source of the river, the, the frog was that same thing. And, and the name of this goddess was called Hecate. H-E-K-E-T. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which is the goddess of, of childbirth and fertility. And, and so this was an extremely important god. In, in most cultures and with multiple gods, you're going you're gonna to have a god something like this uh, with, with fertility. And, and uh, so according to tradition, she was the wife of the god of Canuum, and that's spelled K-H-N-U-M. So I don't know why there's so many consonants before there's a vowel, but that's the way it is. And this god was considered the creator god. Now when we look at these gods, these ancient gods that these people worshiped in these, in these various cultures, there's gonna be a lot of similarities to what is found in the Bible, to, to the true God. Now, obviously, there's not a multi, um, multiplicity of gods that we, that we worship. We worship one God in three forms and, and three manifestations of God. Um, but but th these gods are going to be, you know, one particular part of the God that we worship. All right? And, and so this, this creator God, this is so interesting. He, uh, he was considered, he would create each person. This God Canuum. He would create each person and he would go to the Nile River. Once again, that source. He'd go to the Nile River, he'd grab some clay. And he'd form this person on the potter's wheel. And then the God Hecate would come and breathe life into that God. And then place it in the womb of the woman. Now think about that. That's, obviously, that's not what we believe, but that you look at the similarities between creation, what God did, and what they believe here. Satan has, has taken what, what, what really happened and just changed some of the facts, and, and it sounds similar, and yet it's so far removed from what we believe. Interestingly enough, they believe life hap was formed was before it was born. So we, we're... I don't know, in our country today, we're talking about abortion and when, is, when does a child become a child and when, is it, when does life begin? And, and according to the Egyptians, they believed life began right at the beginning and was placed into, that, into the human body. The goddess, this goddess had the form of, of a person with a frog's head. Right? To me, that's humorous, but that's, that's the way it is. Uh, pregnant women would often wear amulets or pendants now, an amulet is, like I said, it's like a pendant, but it typically has to do with the occult. So th there's amulets even to this day where, you know, 
they have satanic things on the emblem and or pendant and so forth, and, and they would worship. Um, and that was, that was thought, thought of as protection while you were, while the woman was, was pregnant. She was also involved, this god Hecate, in the resurrection of the dead. In pyramid texts, she, uh, she assists the pharaoh once he dies as he makes his way to the eternal side, to the eternal stars. So once again, we see that, that even though the Bible hasn't been written yet, Satan has taken some of these, these ideas, and, and obviously these, these ideas were, were there. The, the ancient, or the, the saints before this time period, God had prepared them, or God had told them what was going on, and they were familiar with many of these different things, and, uh, and Satan, once again, is copying it. You could look at this God similar to a midwife, in the process of having birth. Now, do you remember that just a few years earlier that Pharaoh had commanded all, he, he went to the two midwives, remember, and says, whatever male child comes out, throw them into the Nile River. And you see, once again, God is saying, listen, you remember what you did back then? I'm going to take the God, one of the gods, that, that, the God of, of fertility, the, the God that, that, that you think was, that is important, but you didn't think it was important to the Hebrew children. And so I'm going to take that God, and I'm going to throw it back in your face. I'm going to say, you know, you, this, this is the God you worship? Well, well, guess what? It's not a very powerful God. I know, I find that fascinating. <clears throat> in the hieroglyphics, there's a tadpole with a phrase following, which represents the repeating of life, the concept of rebirth after the afterlife. It's the second birth. You, you see all the pictures here that, that, are, that are coming forth out of these guys? It's, to me, it's, it's amazing. So I mentioned earlier that it was a sacred animal. So the frogs, you cannot kill a frog. So if you're from the south and you've had fried frog legs for dinner, that was not a delicacy here in Egypt. You couldn't, you couldn't do that. In fact, if you accidentally killed a frog, you could be put to death. Even in the accidental, you know, you're walking along and you step on a frog and, you know, or kids playing with a frog and they hurt the frog, that, that, that person would be put to death. So it was a very, um, very important to them. The frogs were considered magical. And I mentioned earlier that, so, so, the god Happy and the god uh, Hecate, they kind of work, they, they coincide with one another. So when the, when the Nile River would flood, it would, it would bring all those nutrients to the land. And, and they had frogs, but magically it would seem that as soon as the, the, the Nile River receded back into its banks, these frogs would be everywhere. It was almost like magic. The, the water goes away. Where did all the frogs come from? And, and so it was th that, ma that magical thing of, that the Egyptians believed. And, and so the, the uh, pharaohs, magicians, and, and priests, and so forth, they played on this m magical thing, and they, they would work the people. They, would, they, they wanted that magic that, to, to be part of their, their lives. So we, what we come from this is no harm must ever be done to that frog. And so this is the setting. This is, this is what's happening right now. Um, that, that's their belief system. So now once we understand the importance of the frog, the sacredness of the frog, and, and all these different things, now we, can, now we can read this verse again. You can't do anything harmful to these frogs. Now let's look at that verse again with that in our minds. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly which shall go up and come into thine house, into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. Totally different thing. You just can't get your, you know, your, your shotgun out and start blowing frogs away. That was not a, um, something that you could do. So let's go, now that we know where these frogs are coming from, Let's go a little bit deeper into their culture. 
and understand why they can't do these different things and how it's, a, it's, a, it's insulting to them. All right, so no nation of antiquity, no, none of the ancient um, governments or cultures set such a value on, a, on cleanliness as the Egyptians. When they would wear those white gowns or linens and or whatever, that was, they, those were there because they, they were cleansed. They, they wanted to be clean. They were a very clean, clean people. In fact, the priests were required to dress entirely in linen. And they had to wash their, their bodies in cold water twice in the morning and twice in the evening. Think about that. Four baths, four showers, whatever, a day. That's what they, that was their, the value of their cleanliness. And, and other classes, you know, you have the priests, which would be at the high end of the food chain, and then all other classes, people all the way down. It was required of them to take um, frequent baths, and, and utmost, it was utmost, they gave utmost care to avoid contact with, with whatever was unclean. So it's extremely important. And now we see where the frogs are dwelling. Where are they living? The Bible mentions the bedroom first, the bed. Can you imagine? Can you imagine your, I mean, I like clean sheets, and you, you know, you work all day, you, you take a shower, you come in, and the sheets are clean, and, and oh man, what a, can you imagine getting into bed and, and there's frogs everywhere? And I'm not, talking about a few frogs they were they were everywhere everywhere what a it's difficult to conceive a, a greater annoyance to the egyptians than frogs in the bedchamber and on the bed occasionally you know you, you, you'll hear a, a mouse or something in your house right and you hear that mouse in your house and it's immediately what you want to do is usually it's at night when everything's quiet and you see something, a little thing crawling, running across the floor, and what do you do? Well, you want to catch that dumb thing. So you start setting traps out and traps out there, everywhere, and trying to catch those things because you don't want, you know that it's there and, and you want to get rid of it. There's no way to get rid of these frogs. They're in the kneading troughs, in the food containers, in the water vessels, in the ovens, in every crevice, there's a frog. You couldn't walk in the streets without treading on them. You couldn't close a door without crushing one. You couldn't breathe without smelling them. You couldn't sit down without smashing one. You couldn't even sleep without rolling over on one. And you couldn't think without seeing one. Every waking moment, there, there was a frog. And you can't do anything to, to, to kill them. You can't, you don't even want to really touch them. So what do you do? What a misery. And the people of Egypt began to loathe these animals. The God that they worship, this magical creature, they begin, they begin to have disdain for it. They begin to, to hate the God that they're supposed to worship. And this is not the only occasion that this happened. In fact, Aristotle and, and several other historians throughout, throughout history have recorded on multiple times throughout history that cities were plagued by such a multitude of frogs that the people would, would fill the, uh, the frogs would fill the houses and the streets. They infected the waters, invaded the cooking utensils, made all the food uneatable. And after a time, the people would, would, were un, unable to bear these pests and, and they would flee the region altogether. I don't know if you've ever seen videos of, uh, in Australia of, of the rats, the mice. And I've seen, and they, I guess this is a common problem. Every five or six years, they have a, they'll have a rat infestation, and, and there's tens of millions of rats everywhere. I mean, you, you open your house to your, or the door to your house, and, and they're just running out in hordes. And, and then they eat, they eat, they, they, they destroy the land, and when they're finally, when there's no food, they just all die off. And a couple more years later, that happens all over again. What a, what a way to live. What a way to live. Verse number four. And the frog shall come up both on thee and upon thy people and upon all thy servants. Now the first, remember the first plague of the, of the water turning, the Nile 
all the water turning into blood. That affected Pharaoh. But in a sense, it didn't affect him because if he needed water, his servants were going to go find water. If he needed something to eat or whatever, and, and obviously they got much of their water that they would get, they would get from the fruits or whatever that they would eat. And, and, and so Pharaoh would, was affected in some, it was an inconvenience, but because of his position, he was able, to, he still had the good, the nice things of life. But this one, he was, he was plagued. He could tell his servants, get the frogs out of my house, but, but can you imagine as soon as you open the door? And it, I don't know, the Bible, the Bible says that they came out of, out, of, out, out of the rivers, out of the canals. But how did they get into the houses if you had doors and everything that, and, you, and you could keep them? I don't know where they came from, but, but somehow there was like almost an instantaneous thing of frogs. A, a, a multiplicity that could not be described. And, and, and Pharaoh was affected by this and, and it bothered him. It bothered him. And we're going to see in a couple of verses how he, he wants to get rid of these things. And The volume of frogs. There was no hope of living a peaceful life. Everything, everyone was affected. Everyone was affected. You know, sin is the same way, is it not? Sin affects everybody. It affects each one of us. Now, if, even if we've, once we've come to salvation and have come to Christ, and, and sin, the power of sin will reign in us, but it still affects us. The sin nature still affects us. We still sin. The, the effects of, of this world, and even, even other people's sin can affect us. It affects every one of us. The Bible says we have all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Think about that. You just place yourself in the middle of, of Egypt at this time with all the frogs. It affected everybody. It affected everybody. And, and sometimes... Most of the time, if it's something is happening to somebody else or something, another region of the country, we don't even think about it, right? I, I, I watch the Weather Channel just because of where we live and the snow and everything, and, and they, they'll start saying, wow, this place got a foot of snow. Really, a foot of snow? That's nothing, right? We, we hardly, we, we, we don't even break it, it, nothing happens. We just keep on going. A foot of snow is nothing to us. Because we learn, we, we live with it every day. But if there's a fire somewhere else, like we live in California, and we'd have fires all the time, and it was just a common thing. And even though we lived kind of in the Southern California, and this, it basically it's a massive city, you could see sometimes, you could see the fires. But, but because it's a fire, everyone, oh man, it's a big thing. Or an earthquake. Well, we got a little earthquake, and we, had, we I mean, we felt a few every year. We felt small earthquakes, and oh, well, how can you live with that? Well, you, you start to live with, now we didn't get hit with a big one, but, but the same kind of thing. So when we think of these frogs, oh, that's not, it wasn't that big of a deal. But once you experience it, it's a big deal. It changed, it changed the way that they thought. I'm talking about core values. I'm talking about, about their belief in their God system. It was being shaken to the very core. Think about that. Think about what, what, what if one day you woke up and, and as Christians, as, as being here on a Sunday morning in Sunday school, and, and you wake up and, and all of a sudden a pa pastor comes out and goes, you know what, I don't believe the Bible anymore. I, in fact, I think there's some, some falsehoods here, and, and, and let me show you why. And, and then, and then it's, it starts to all of a sudden you realize, oh, maybe he's right. And everything that, I've, that, I've, that I believed my entire life is, is for naught. That's what's happening to the Egyptian people. Now, Pharaoh's hard-headed. He's not going to change. Eventually he does for, for briefly, like here he's going to change briefly, but then he's going to quickly change his mind. But think about the other people. Think about how it, how it would affect them. Let's go to verses 5 and 6. And the Lord spake unto Moses, 
Say unto Aaron, stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Isn't it fascinating that God can use such a small animal, a small part of his creation, to wreak so much havoc? A little frog. I find it kind of disheartening that man believes. You know, Mother Nature is, is the god of the age. You think about it, you, so oftentimes, like the Weather Channel, well, what, what's Mother Nature doing today? We worship, our, our world worships Mother Nature. And it's nothing, nothing is new. It's been like this since the dawn of time. Think about in, in, earlier in Genesis, man couldn't build a tower high enough to heaven. God destroyed it. They couldn't stop a worldwide flood. And they're not going to stop what we call global warming. Then man's not going to be able to stop it. Well, we say we have all the answers. But God says one day this world's going to burn up. God is in control and man is out of control. The frogs came and Pharaoh and his gods couldn't stop it. Ultimately, nothing can stop the all-powerful, almighty God. Let's go to verse number 7. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Last week we talked about they were able to, to imitate this, uh, the, the last miracle. But once again, it's, it's just sleight of hand. The, the, nobody's fact-checking. Nobody's looking and saying, was that really a frog? Or are you just you know, quickly you know, drawing it out of your, 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 your robe or whatever? They're able to conjure up this magic trip and they would uh, seduce the people to awe them. You know what? Satan does that every single day. Satan does that every day, seduces, tricks people. Even the Bible predicts that even the elect were nearly deceived. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall rise false, prof false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, that shall deceive the very elect. And many people, and many believers today, I, I mean, if, if they truly know Christ and they can believe in Christ, but, but there's things that they can even be deceived. We can be deceived. And so it's so important for us to know God, to know who he is, to be uh, ready to give an answer. Verse number eight, our final verse. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. The very first sign that Pharaoh is, is yielding. Yielding his hardness. Just a few, and, and look what he says. Entreat the Lord. He's acknowledging their God. He's acknowledging the, the God of the Hebrews. A few days earlier, he didn't know who this God was. Who is Jehovah? Who is the Lord? I don't know this. He knows who Elohim is. He's sort of that God. Uh, but who is Jehovah? And now he's acknowledging to Aaron and to Moses, go to your God, go to the Lord, and entreat. He's beginning to know him. But not really to know him. He, he knows about his power. He knows about his justice. But he doesn't know about his being part of his life personally. But it's interesting. This is hard for Pharaoh to do this. If you recall, I've mentioned it multiple times, that, that Pharaoh was that mediator between the gods. He could go to the gods. He could... He could listen to the gods. The gods would speak to him, and he would go to his people, and he would talk to his people about what the gods... See, he was that mediator. Now, he's having to go to Aaron and Moses as the mediator to go to their god and entreat for him. A totally different shift. You see how it's difficult for, for the Pharaoh to do that? It's hard for us to do that. Isn't it? Isn't it hard for us sometimes to, to, to go to him 
and, and to fellowship with him and, and to ask for forgiveness for those things that we've done. It's hard for us to humble ourselves. And ultimately, that's what Pharaoh's dealing with. He's dealing with pride. Dealing with pride. Oh, that we would humble ourselves as we come to, to, to our Savior for what he did. To think what those shepherds did when they came to that manger, when they came to the scene, and they bowed before a baby. It takes a little bit of humility to come, even though they, it's, the, it's the Messiah, they knew who this was. It still takes a little bit of humility to bow before that baby. What did Herod do? Herod was not going to bow to that baby. Herod went out to destroy that baby. <clears throat> that word entreat. It's a word we don't readily use. In fact, it's almost archaic. We don't use this word very often in, in day-to-day English. But that word means to earnestly beg, earnestly, to plead with, to implore. Almost the idea of, of, of begging for your life, begging for mercy. You're there before the judge, and, and you're treating him, and you're on your, on your hands and your knees, and, and, and you're just begging. That's what Pharaoh's doing. Now, this is not a, a kingly attribute and yet Pharaoh knows he knows his priest perhaps he he knows that they that, that they're you know they are enchantments they're not really doing what they're saying they're doing it's I'm sure he knew the inner innermost parts of those magic tricks but here he is he's, he's entreating they, they don't have the answers his gods don't have the answers but they're his their gods Aaron and Moses' God, they do, he does have the answers. I'm gonna, I need to go to that God, but I can't go to him personally. i got to go to them so that he, they can go to God and bring what I, what I need for my people. Not something that a king like this would do. And you know what? We have the opportunity as, as believers. We don't, we don't have to go to a priest. We don't have to go to another human we can go right to the mediator, Jesus Christ. We can go right to that babe that was born. And we have that mediator where we can have fellowship with God. What a great, great thing that we possess. And so oftentimes, we really don't take advantage. We don't appreciate that relationship that we can have. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for for what you, what you wrote in the Word of God, showing these plagues and, and understanding them in a new light, understanding that, that this was not just uh, you trying to, to, to bring your people out of, out of Egypt, but Lord, it was a, it was a war, a uh, long war against God. Satan and, and what he was doing with the Egyptians and deceiving and, and, and you bringing the truth. Well, that, ultimately, that's what it comes down to. It, even to this day, we celebrate Christmas and, and how today it's not Christmas, it's celebrating the holidays and trying to take Christ out of, out of the true meaning of Christmas. Lord, as we, as we continue on these next few weeks and celebrating this Christmas season, that, that Lord, we would understand, truly understand what it's about. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 15 minutes in the next service.